In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Christ is risen. Um, today is class 19 of our Orthodox Survival Course. Last week we began talking about the so-called Enlightenment, or the period between the Renaissance and the modern revolutionary period. And last week we talked about the 17th century. This week we're going to talk about the 18th century. Last week we began our discussion of the so-called Enlightenment by giving an overview of the period, introducing the philosophical schools of empiricism and rationalism, and talking about the three philosophers of the about three philosophers of the 17th century, Descartes, Locke, and Hobbes. This week we need to look carefully at the 18th century, a time of enormous change. It was a time of it was the pivot from the so-called age of reason to the age of revolution, which openly begins with the French Revolution of 1789 and is continuing until now. The French Revolution opened the current era that we're in now. Mm -hmm. As a little parenthesis, uh, some might say the opening of the Age of Revolution was the so-called American Revolution, which is more accurately called the American Secession from the British Empire, and I'll, I'll talk about why I think that's more accurate. But this is not precisely correct, uh, the revolution, the, the idea that it's a revolution, for reasons I shall explain as a preface to our class in the French Revolution. The real start of the revolutionary period is really the French Revolution. Last week I also mentioned that by this time European society had become bifurcated into a public and a secret life. And that this week we would discuss the secret societies in which the overthrow of the Christian order was being planned in the 18th century. There are, however, public aspects of the life of that period which we remain, which, which that should be, which remain, which remain to be discussed. I'll just go to the subject of the secret societies briefly later toward the end of the class uh, as part of our discussion tonight. So let's contrast, first of all, the 17th and 18th centuries. Though for the sake of organizing our course, I have put both the 17th and 18th centuries in the Enlightenment period, and many historians treat it that way, right? There are still distinct differences between the two periods. One obvious difference is that in the 17th century, there is little or no open discussion of the actual overthrow of the church and the monarchies. The Protestant revolt was in full swing in Northern Europe and the British Isles, but even the Protestant nations set up state churches supporting their native monarchies. And the monarchies supported the state churches. It was still kind of what could be called a Constantinian order of society, even though many really revolutionary scientific and philosophical changes were taking place. Um, the order of society was still publicly, or op uh, the public aspect of society was still some kind of a union of a Christian church with a, with a, with a monarchical <coughs> state. Even the 17th century British American colonies had state churches, something that people often don't know. They're not told when they study American history. Um, in the mainstream leftist American history I learned as a child, we were told the original American colonists came seeking religious freedom, but what often was not mentioned, it was only freedom for their group. Okay? And then when they got here, they set up their own state church in their own whatever colony they were in. So either the state church of England, if it was a royal colony, and those are the ones who, who sometimes were or weren't being persecuted in England, depending on who was in charge, or a state church of one of the dissenting groups, as in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, where they had a state reform church. Okay? And later on, the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States will not forbid the states from establishing state churches, only the federal government. It's a, a, a very big misunderstanding about, about, uh, about that, that there will be no establishment of religion. They did not forbid the states from establishing a religion. That's why Thomas Jefferson, who was a deist and a free thinker and hated the idea of a state church and hated the church, was proud of himself for authoring the statute on religious freedom in the, in, the, in the state of Virginia, or the colony of Virginia, because up to that point, there was an established church. The Anglican church was the established church in the colony of Virginia. See? So the idea of having an established or a state church runs, still runs very deep in the thought of these European people, even though revolutionary movements and thoughts were, were growing, you see. Now our friends from last week, Hobbes and Locke, created a revolutionary idea of the origins of government. Remember last week we talked about the social contract. That's a revolutionary idea about the origin of government. But they did not advocate the overthrow of the traditional structures of the government. Okay? Hobbes's Leviathan State, his famous treatise, Leviathan, right, was a monarchy operating under the concept of the divine right of kings. Under his conception of the social contract, there was no reason why a king should not sit atop the whole structure of the social contract. And as a Christian, Hobbes was not advocating a purely secular society. Okay? Obviously, the church was needed to restrain the brutish instincts of man. Remember, Tom Hobbes said that prior to the social contract, 
man's life is nasty and brutish and short, and man needs force to keep them keep him under and to behave himself. Right. So the church was needed in in this Hobbesian view. The church's role is to restrain the brutish instincts of man, to create conditions in which the social contract would be honored. And we still see this idea today in so-called conservative political thought. So today, we have to understand that in American political discourse, what's called conservatism is usually classical liberalism. It's, it's, it's defending the, the, the classical liberalism that, that's the foundational ideology of the original American Republic. And um, so to me, you, you'll see in conservative political discourse that Christianity and its institutions are useful Right? in producing a virtuous populace, a love enough wisdom and self-restraint to keep the social contract. So it's not for salvation. It's, no, it's a worldly, it's a worldly conception. Mm -hmm. It's a good yes. thing. If you, if you looked at, if you looked at um, uh, Putin's Easter message to the Russian people that he sent out, he, said, he, doesn't, he says, uh, the resurrection, this feast is a feast of joy and hope, these vague things, joy, hope, peace, love, you know. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and uh, we honor the Orthodox Church because it, you know, it basically teaches the people virtue and family values. Yes. So it's a remember, but 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 remember, the the leftists now in charge in the West hate Putin because, from in their point of view, he's a horrible conservative and a traditionalist because he believes that there's a place for a church or a religion in society to influence people. See, but but th this idea of, of the church simply as a prop for a secular society this goes way back. You see, because there, there are the people who are still, cons uh, don't get me wrong, there are many people still concerned about their salvation, right? But the political thought that's developing, the philosophical thought that's developing uh, in the West is leading more and more and more, tending more and more and more to the idea of a secular society with the church as an obedient department of the state, of the church as a, as a prop to a uh, successful earthly life. Okay? Of course, in American the American culture, we see this in a crude or vulgar, idiotic form in the prosperity gospel and so forth. You know, if you're, you're saved, you'll be saved and you'll get a Cadillac and, and a nice house and that, that kind of thing. But in a more sophisticated way, uh, this goes back to a great deal of classical liberal thought that in, Amer in American political discourse is regarded now as conservative thought or traditional American political thought. Okay. In the 18th century now, leaving behind Locke and Hobbes in the 17th century. In the 18th century, by contrast, we begin to see open talk about replacing the old union of church and throne. Voltaire, for example, comes just right out and says it publicly, right? The people are writing articles. Thomas Paine in England and America, writing, openly writing, you know, let's, let's strangle the last king with the entrails of the last priest. Then we'll, have, then we'll have a just social order, you see. So they want to replace church and throne with a secular republican form of government based, again, on the social contract. They, so once they're taking this idea of the social contract, they agree with that. They're taking that from Locke and from Hobbes, right? But they have new ideas like the rights of man and a new religion of pure reason. This idea of a religion of pure reason replacing revealed religion, which they regard as superstition. Mm -hmm. okay. Later in the French Revolution, this religion of reason will become simply... Uh, a little disguised, orgiastic, demonic, and ironically, extremely irrational paganism. Right? They just go wild. Right? They're, they're enthroning a prostitute on the altar of Notre Dame as the goddess of reason, and all around they're engaging in the most horrible debauchery and, and Dionysian orgies of murder, of, of license, of immorality, of all kinds of things. So you see that if man tries to replace revealed truth with his so-called reason, he actually flips over into this uh, uh, ensla being enslaved in the most irrational passions and the most idiotic superstitions. You know, you could, you could, we could characterize the Enlightenment period as a period of Apollonianism, right? If you go back to a pagan, the duality between the two pagan spirits of the Apollonian spirit and the Dionysian spirit, okay? So if their trust is in Apollo, the god of light, right? then all is reason, all is light, all is balance, all is calmness, all is truth. But since that's a false god, since that god doesn't really exist, or if he exists, he's demonic, there's nothing to keep you from flipping then into your Dionysian side, your Bacchanalian side mm -hmm. of carnal passions. See, Because once you abandon the real god and the real church, 
and, and, and you adopt these ideologies that are really based on nothing new, actually, ancient pagan ideas and ancient pagan passions and, and p p demonic possessions, and this is what you get, right? So, but in it, before, before the explosion and before the, the obvious irrationality of the French Revolution, in its more sanitary or calm or philosophical form, in pre-revolutionary Enlightenment philosophy, the period we're studying now, this religion of reason is called deism. What's deism? Okay. And this is important for us to understand because deism is the actual theology of many of the American founders. Not all. Not all the American. Some of the American founders were uh, Orthodox with a small o. I mean, Orthodox Christians in the sense that they believed in the Trinity, they believed in the Incarnation, they believed in the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ and so forth. They believed in that Christ is the path to salvation. They believed in having some kind of a church. That was some of the founding fathers, but many of them, and some of the most influential, were free thinkers and deists, including people like Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. Okay. So what is deism? Deism can be understood by contrasting it with theism. Okay. Both terms, of course, mean belief in God or a God of some kind. Theism is from theos, the Greek word for God, and deism is from deus, the Latin word for God. Uh, that they, these, these, they just chose and they created these, these terms, you see. It could have been the other way around, but it's not, it didn't end up that way. So theism, <clears throat> the kind of God or God that you are talking about is radically different, of course. Theism teaches a personal God who creates the world and then keeps interacting with his creation, guiding and caring for his creation, man in particular. Okay? So the revealed God, the true God, is... We, is, is, a, is the God of theism, right? the, the personal God who created the world and by his providence he governs the world and he interacts with his creatures, especially man. Okay? But deism, this 18th century philosophy, teaches a deus absconditus, a God who is absconded. He created everything. He's the great clockmaker. He created everything. They went off in a corner and went to sleep. And then the, the universe just runs on this beautiful, uh, according to the laws of science and laws of nature, the universe just runs like a giant mechanism. Okay? This conception of God has been like to that of the great clockmaker, who makes a perfect clock and he winds it up and he lets it work independently. The deists were enraptured by the discoveries of 17th and 18th century science. They believed that Newton had spoken the last word about physics and astronomy, right? And that you could, you could use the laws... The, 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 the methods of mathematics and of empirical science to discover all the laws of the universe and you would discover that everything is per perfectly rational and there's no need for the supernatural or the miraculous to explain anything. Everything can be explained naturally, right, by means of science. Okay? I, didn't, I didn't have a separate section on science last week or this week, but we have to remember that the... the, the the, the direction of science and the discoveries and the, the new theories of science profoundly influenced all of this thought. That they thought they had arrived at this stasis in which they finally, they finally had a completely rational conception of the universe that, that didn't need any kind of miraculous or uh, supernatural intervention to explain how anything, how anything happened. So they believed that man had discovered the laws of the universe through reason and these laws governed everything. Not God's personal presence, not God's energies, not divine providence, but the laws of nature governed everything. Okay? And we, we have to realize for our orthodox survival toolkit, okay, we have to realize that to a great extent this naive scientism still dominates the thought of the masses. This idea has remained to this day. And it's been drilled into people over and over again. Science says, science says, this study says, mm -hmm. science says... Right. Now, the actual scientists know that this isn't true. Right? They know that the more that they, first of all, they know that the ones in the academic community know that, that a, a very high percentage of studies are frauds. Right? So that there's so much dishonesty, so much fraudulence, so much lying. Um, they also know that even the legitimate discoveries are very partial and can't explain everything. And cutting-edge physicists know that the more they learn about physics, the less they have a comprehensive theory of reality. But they don't tell the people that. See, that's for among themselves. And for the, the public, it's science knows all. Science will solve your problems. Bow down to science. 
and they can make up whatever they, they want. That's, well, science says, and science says that. Science says the most outrageous things, and you have to believe it because it's science. Well, this is not science. This is scientism. But this scientism of our time comes from this era, especially in the 17th and 18th centuries, where people really thought that uh, human science was now discovering the, 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 the most uh, profound laws governing the universe, and that everything could ex be explained rationally. Under communism, they had uh, frequently, a few times a, a week, a radio show mm -hmm. called The Science Wins. Science Wins. <laughs> it doesn't say what wins. <laughs> what, what wins? <laughs> well, they mean science defeats religion or something like that. Yeah, yeah the, the Soviets had a, a journal called um, Nauka i Religi. Yeah, science and religion. Or science and life. And life? In Ijizin, yes. So, um, you know, it, it, so it's this, this crude, it's really a, a very crude ideology, right? But people think it's very lofty and very wise. You know, yeah, because they, it's easy for them to yeah, see, it. Yes, they, it's just a, a, something they can mouth, right? So the 18th century deists, for example, some of the men who led the American Revolution and wrote the Constitution, believed, or at least they said they believed, that if only people would be educated enough to understand the laws of nature, they would behave in a rational fashion and create just and orderly societies. Right? Society would become this peaceful, calm, predictable mechanism like the Swiss clock. Okay? Everything would run beautifully. I've, I've just been um, rereading Tolstoy's War and Peace and watching 1960s production by Bondarchuk, it was a Soviet-era production of War and Peace. And there's a character in War and Peace, Prince Nikolai Bolkonsky, who's an old man at the time of Napoleon. And he was a young man. He was in his prime during the days of Catherine the Great. So he's this picture. Tolstoy paints this picture of 18th century man who believes in the rational. And the first, the scene, Bondarchuk does it very well. You see the scene of Prince Nicholas walking in his estate. And he's walking down this perfectly lined, lined up avenue of trees, walking right down the middle, very majestically in his old-fashioned silk c coat and his powdered hair, his powdered wig and his ponytail. And, uh, and he has a, an orchestra playing 18th century music in the woods as he's walking along. See, and, and as he and his son, Prince Andrew, go through the story, you see that they, un, uh, though they're baptized Orthodox, they have no, no trust in the God of Orthodoxy at all. Prince Nicholas trusts in reason because he's from the great, so-called great era of Catherine the Great. And he dies a disappointed, frustrated man because his ideas, of, his rational ideas about how to run the Russian state and the army are not fulfilled. And, and he dies believing that Napoleon's going to conquer Russia. And then uh, his son, Prince Andrew, loses all hope right, in life because all his hope has been placed, his father has only passed on this secular humanistic concept of life, see? So it's a, but it's a great image of the 18th century man. Because people like, there were, there were malevolent, malign occult forces, but there were also just sincere people who actually believed in these things. And very mistakenly, and when they're baptized Orthodox, as we see in Russia, at this point in the 18th century, the West has not yet poisoned the Balkan nations with these ideas because they're still under the domination of, of foreign, foreign powers, right? And, and they haven't developed, in, in a good way, they haven't developed <laughs> some modern ideas, right? Uh, that's going to come in the 19th century. But, it, but in Russia, it happened in the 18th century where these poisonous ideas were reaching into Russia and, and poisoning the minds of Orthodox people and creating this bifurcation in Russian society between the aristocracy and intelligentsia who were aping the French and the Germans and the English and the, the, and the merchant class and the peasantry who were still pious. Oh yeah, and I brought this image of Prince uh, Nikolai Bolkonsky as this image of this 18th century man. Right? He, he believed in this and, and it, it, it crushed him, it disappointed him. Right? Because he says, so the demon of Napoleon, and he can't, he can't wrap his mind around it. He, he can't understand why this is happening. See? Um, <clears throat> so according to this view, this 18th century view, miracles, the intercession of the saints, mystical experience, the sacraments, okay, all of this, in their view, is superstition that has to be swept away. 
They say, yeah, you might have a church. There's a church where they preach reason and where they just, they, they can preach on scripture, but they have to explain in scripture that all the miracles are really didn't really didn't really happen or that there's a natural explanation. See, Thomas Jefferson famously went through his Bible and cut out everything that he didn't believe in. And literally, he has a Bible. I don't know if they kept it at Monticello, if you can see it, but he has a, his personal Bible, he went through with scissors and he cut out all the miracles, cut out everything he didn't believe in. It's an image, that, that Bible of Jefferson is an image of, of the deistic view of, of the Christian faith, right? So the, in their view, miracles, the saints, mystical prayer, the sacraments, confession, uh, most very notably, all this is used by the church authorities to oppress the ignorant masses, and prevent the birth of a new rational society. Okay. It can be tolerated as private superstitious behavior, a hobby, so to speak, something for all women, for the children and the women, okay. but not as an integral part of the public order. Okay. Of course, I also, there's a scene in, in War and Peace where um, Alexander I, one of his, his, uh, his chief of staff or aide-de-camp, I forget which one, his name is Balashov, he goes to see Napoleon as a last-ditch effort to get Napoleon not to invade Russia. Napoleon's in Poland, and already in the Russian Empire, and he's about to invade Russia itself. And Napoleon has him come to dinner, and they sit and they talk in, in a very you know, courtly fashion. And Napoleon says, tell me how many churches are in Moscow? And he says, uh, 200, your majesty. Napoleon says, so many? He says, doesn't the emperor know, I mean Alexander I, or don't you Russians know that so many churches and monasteries is a sign of a backward society? See, so he's coming to enlighten them, right? He's coming to bring reason. With fire in the sword, he's coming to, to bring them to heal. Right? And uh, then the, the Balashov says, well, countries are different. The different countries are different, your majesty. He says, for example, Spain has many churches and monasteries, which is a jab at Napoleon because he'd just been defeated in Spain. See, mm -hmm. So it's just a, Tolstoy's a master at these little vignettes that, sh that really illustrate how these people thought. Sadly for Tolstoy, he died a heretic outside the church. Um, but I, I bring in literature sometimes because th these, these great artists do portray the, the, the reality of these situations much better than abstract explanations can do. So it's a great image, Napoleon saying, well, you know, that's a backward society. They have 200 churches in Moscow. As we have seen in the Renaissance, the more that people exalt reason and decry religion as being irrational, the more they plunge into the irrational. They glorify reason, but they're simultaneously plunging into the irrational. Many of the same people who publicly proclaimed the reign of reason in the 18th century were simultaneously members of secret societies, which practiced occult rituals and bizarre ceremonies. They believed in, in astrology okay? and, and all, kinds of, all kinds of really, really um, irrational things. And these, and these are things that were really for, this is really not a return to reason. This is really, as we've talked of in the Renaissance, it's the recrudescence of ancient paganism, which is demonic. But it's got this cover of rationality and science and uh, a secular society that doesn't have religious fanaticism. See. Now let's talk about 18th century philosophy. Uh, we're going to talk about some, the French and we're going to talk about human Kant, the French. Um, I, looking, researching this, I found an excellent summary in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. You can't always trust what you read in the Internet, of course, but that, that's actually a good article in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy and the French Encyclopedists, at, which I have attached to these notes. Well, I haven't attached them physically. For our class sitting here tonight, I don't have them physically, but I'll send them on um, electronically, um, this uh, little article. The author obviously has traditionalist sympathies, which explains why at the bottom of the article it says that the IEP is actively seeking someone to write an article to replace it. When I read it, I was surprised at how honest it was. And uh, so I said, it is a good article. Okay, so we're going, to, we're going to preserve it. But as the article explains, who are these encyclopedists? Okay. Uh, the encyclopedists were a group of 18th century French intellectuals who created the first encyclopedia, a multi-volume work that claimed to preserve all knowledge. You want to learn about anything, just look it up. There it is. There's the knowledge. There's the truth. They were the first ones to do this, right? 
But their purpose was actually, as the article explains, their purpose was actually polemical and political. It was adversarial. These are men with an agenda. Because all their articles, if you read their articles on anything, religion, reason, philosophy, science, whatever, politics, they're all arguing for the overthrow of the old order. It might be in a very subtle way. These people are highly intelligent. And they're also part of an ancient Christian society. So they, they can't just say, yeah, burn down the whole thing. Uh, crudely, right? They have to weave it into so-called science, right? Well, suggestions, scientists, suggestions. suggestions. Yes, we've found this. We've discovered that. You know, it seems this and so forth. But, but their purpose was to overthrow the church and the throne and to replace the Christian order by a Republican society based on Newton's physics, Locke's metaphysics, and a deistic view of, psych of theology. Now, what are Newton's physics? We know what that is, right? The clockwork universe. Where everything uh, operates according to very predictable rules. Right? And then Locke's metaphysics. Now, this is something that's very important. Remember, we, la last week we studied Locke. Remember, Locke was the one who said that we, we don't think with our ideas, we just think our ideas. I'm going to go back and review that. That's a very important and a very bad shift. Right? So Aristotle, in all classical philosophy, says... And the church fathers agree with this, that we use, our mind uses our ideas as tools to grasp real things. When I, th when I see this cup and say cup, my mind, the idea cup is a tool I'm using to grasp something that's really real. It's really there, and I can know what it is. What Locke says is, we don't think with our ideas about things out there, we just think our ideas. What we're thinking about is simply our ideas. They're in our head. All we can know are our passing sense experiences. Okay. So he's taking that nominalism we talked about weeks ago, he's taking that to a further, into further solipsism, locking people inside their own minds. And he says that metaphysics, the only legitimate metaphysics, is simply studying human psychology as a physiological phenomenon. Now, metaphysics, of course, is the, the area of philosophy in which we study that which is beyond the material, right? Eternal principles, universal essences, okay? But Locke is saying there is no metaphysic. The only genuine metaphysic, the only genuine ultimate science of truth is simply experimental psychology. It's studying ph the physiological aspects of psychology. Which, of course, ultimately leads to skepticism and nihilism. Right? But, but the encyclopedists, are, they love this. They're, they're in favor of this, you see. And they're in favor of this deistic view of theology. The contributors are, are famous names. Diderot was the editor-in-chief. And then there's, of course, Voltaire and Rousseau and others. Let's talk about these two big names, Voltaire and Rousseau. Who are these people? Voltaire is the pen name of a man named Francois-Marie Arouet who died in 1778. He was a man of letters who popularized these ideas. Now, Voltaire was uh, a playwright, right? Uh, uh, someone who wrote short essays, someone who wrote popular, popular <coughs> writings that, that, that normal, just regular educated people could access. You didn't have to be a specialist. You didn't have to be a, 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 a super intellectual, as you would perhaps, it'd be more difficult to read Locke or to read Hobbes. It'd be more difficult to read Leibniz or Spinoza, some of these people. But anybody could read Voltaire. Right? Voltaire is fun reading, right? He wrote plays. He wrote broadsides he'd put into newspapers, you know. He wrote a, had a huge correspondence, and he gave talks. He popularized these revolutionary ideas among the intellectuals and aristocrats of European and American society. He was openly contemptuous of the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, that was the church that was established in France. His church, right? Mm -hmm. And by extension, the Christian church as an institution in union with the state anywhere. He called for the abolition. His, his, his infamous motto was, écraser la femme, uh, crush the loathsome thing, meaning the church. Okay. But he knew, at the same time, the man knew that his so-called rational philosophy based on science would actually lead to social chaos. He knew this. These men all knew what this was leading to. For example, at dinners where he discussed his philosophy with his, his social equals, he would dismiss the servants first. 
when he started to talk about his real ideas, he'd, let the ser- he'd tell the servants to leave the room because he knew if, that if his servants accepted his ideas, they'd murder him in his bed. Right? They'd steal all his property. <laughs> this, this, this hypocrisy right, is characteristic of all the modern revolutionaries. They profess to love humanity, but they despise the mass of people. They believe themselves part of a chosen elite. Later on, we're going to have Marx and his vanguard of the proletariat. They're the chosen elite who are going to destroy the existing order and create their own order with them on top. They happen to be the chosen ones. We see this today. Okay, the, the elites who control our education, our media, and our government, they profess all kinds of love for the oppressed, but they actually are insane with self-love. Right? They're intoxicated mm-hmm. with themselves, with their power. And they ruthlessly crush anyone who opposes them by the most infamous means, assassination, blackmail, slander, mm-hmm. lies, you know, just constant, constant, terrible things. I heard the, well, it was years back and I couldn't find it again, but supposedly uh, it's a... Before he died, he asked for forgiveness. Voltaire? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they c- c- actually yeah. confessed? Or yeah. That's quite possible. I need to read more about that. Yeah. I, yeah. I couldn't find it. And I'm, I'm not saying this to condemn the man to hell myself. I don't know how he died. But, he's, but these are his ideas. Yeah. 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 I mean, God have mercy on him. Of course, the, dying as a Roman Catholic, he died outside the Orthodox Church anyway. But we would hope that he would had repented within his own religious upbringing, he returned to it and repented somehow. <clears throat> yeah. Now let's talk about Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who's a younger contemporary of Voltaire. Rousseau had various ideas, but perhaps his most famous idea is le bon sauvage, the good savage, or the noble savage. Okay. So Rousseau took Locke's and Hobbes' idea of the state of nature that exists prior to society. But he rejected Hobbes' idea of the natural man being a violent brute. And he created a myth that there were were once noble savages running around the world, right, before history began, before civilization. And their purity and innocence were corrupted by civilization. So if only one could get rid of government and religion and laws, everything that trammels man, everything that restrains his activity, it restrains his passions. If you could just get rid of all these things, mm. everybody would return to being happy, innocent, childlike beings who never harmed anyone. And they'd be in harmony with nature. What does this remind you of? It's like the libertarians, right? This is libertarian. This is like an ex- extreme libertarianism. No government. No government. No mm. laws. Just everybody, do your thing. But keep in mind, they were both of them the same group. Yes. So one has a job, and one has another. Yes, yes. They're saying this. They're, they're, they're all after the same goals. Yeah. And Rousseau made up a philosophy of education. He wrote a whole book on education based precisely on this idea in which children were not to be corrected or instructed. So left to, to themselves to discover and be creative. Does that sound familiar? Like nowadays. It's, yeah, this is related to the various insane educational methods we're still stuck with today. That just gets cycled around. Same old stuff. Just gets cycled through. They make oh, then they throw it out the next year, and they got another one. But it always gets back to no, no rote memorization, no correction. We're just going to let them be free. But of course, it's no spelling, no grammar, <clears throat> and so forth. Later, the Jacobins, who are the most radical French revolutionaries, the ones who were chopping thousands of people's heads off. Rousseau was their favorite philosopher. If you follow his ideas to their logical extreme, you would say, well, just destroy everything. Burn it down to the ground. Start all over again with no religion, no laws, no structure, no nothing. This is the Jacobin mindset. Okay. As I said in the 60s, burn, baby, burn. Okay. Of course, once the nice mask of innocence is dropped, what you really have is a law of the jungle. Might mix right. Because, of course, there is original sin is real. And men are not noble savages. Men are fallen. Now, now of course, you know, there's, there are elements of truth in everything that they say. For example, we would say, yes, um, if you meet an old-fashioned peasant 
from the, the, from the country, an old-fashioned Orthodox or Christian peasant from the country who's very simple, in tune with nature, goes to church. Yes, he's much nobler than a, a, a sophisticated, jaded city guy uh, who's making lots of money and, and driving around in his big car and so forth and so on. But the contrast is not between uh, a noble savage and someone who's been corrupted by society. The contrast is between a Christian who's living according to God's law and informed by generations of piety and a former or apostate Christian or someone whose ancestors were Christian but who has become a modern person. You see? But, but, but this, there can be this appeal in, in Rousseau. Yes, if only we were simpler. Tolstoy has some of these ideas. So Tolstoy's heresy, you know, just be simple, live like the peasants, be close to the earth. And he imagined all these peasants were, were uh, nature worshippers. In fact, they were orthodox people who were just in tune with nature because they were orthodox. See. Of course, Voltaire and Rousseau were partially right. If they were not, their ideas would have no power. Only partially true ideas have power. It's things that are totally false at first, on, and until, until you really confuse people. I mean, at the end of the process, you can't tell them totally ridiculous things. That's what's going on now. But for the most of human history, to, to propagandize, you'd have to use at least partially true uh, teachings, right? For example, the Roman Catholic Church is not the true church, right? We could sympathize and say, yes, there are many things wrong with it. There are many abuses, many false teachings in the seven centuries that had elapsed between the schism from the Orthodox Church and Voltaire's time. The, the Roman Church needed to repent, return to Orthodoxy. So that's true. We could say, yes, oh, Voltaire, you're right. There are a lot of things wrong with the Roman Catholic Church. But Voltaire's answer is not to return to Orthodoxy. He did the Orthodox Church too. All the Western elites despise the Russians. And they despise all the Orthodox as being backwards, being savages, being barbarians. See? Voltaire's answer is to destroy the Christian faith and all of its institutions altogether. Rousseau's idea of the noble savage is a twisted version of a biblical truth, Edenic innocence. Mm -hmm. Yes, our first parents were innocent. Right? We all perceive that at one time there was a golden age and man somehow lost his innocence. Man became evil. But Genesis tells us what we need to know about this. Rousseau didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Genesis told us what happened. Man was created innocent by God and fell into sin through disobeying God's law. But Rousseau turns this on its head. He says man became evil because of law. Because of order being imposed from without. Rousseau basically is repeating the lie of Satan. Just forget about God's law. Just do your thing. Do what you want. In Rousseau's idea, there's no sin, just oppression. Right? Later on, we have Marx's idea of the class warfare. Today, we have, you know, the, there's no sin. There's just oppression and injustice and unfairness, prejudice, right? white privilege, and so forth and so on. So according to Rousseau, man is sinless. Original sin does not exist. And if people were allowed just to do whatever they wanted, all would be well. Do your thing. Okay. Of course, none of these men can point. They claim to be scientific. None of them can point to such a society that's ever existed. They're proposing something that has never existed, and they're proposing that if we just try it, it's going to be wonderful. Okay. It's like all these educational theories. Never been tried before, but we're just going to do it. We're just going to experiment on the children. We're just going to do it. It's going to be wonderful. Okay. But we know how it turns out. Now let's go um, outside of France and talk about two other fellows, David Hume and Immanuel Kant. Hume and Kant are important because each brings his respective school of thought, empiricism in Hume's case, and rationalism in Kant's case, to its logical conclusion. They kind of, you know, Hume and then Kant's response to Hume kind of bring down the curtain on this whole era of Enlightenment philosophy. <clears throat> and, they, and Kant is the transition point to 19th century philosophy, especially Hegel. Okay. Hume argues, in essence, for total skepticism. He's taking empiricism to its logical conclusion, right? All we have to go on is an unconnected series of sense impressions. Beyond that, we can't know anything. Because even Locke was too optimistic about what you can know. <laughs> he can't know anything. Okay. 
Kant read Hume, and then he famously said that Hume had awakened him from his dogmatic slumber, his uncritical acceptance of the previous rational philosophers like Descartes and Spinoza and Leibniz. Kant felt he needed to rescue reason from Hume's critique, so he wrote his own famous Critique of Pure Reason, which became the foundation for all further development of European philosophical thought about epistemology, how we know things. Epistemology is the study of how, or the philosophical school of how do you know? What, what does it mean to have knowledge? Okay. So Kant says, yes, we do have reason. Reason does work. It's not a total uh, waste of time the way Hume feels it is. But to rescue reason from Kant, Hume's critique, he posits two realms, the really real of what he calls the noumenal realm, which is real. There is something real out there, but we can't know it. And the knowable but fragmentary world of the phenomenal realm, which has no coherence, no inherent meaning. It's just a bunch, as Hume says, he, he accepted Hume's description of how these things work. There's just these phenomena and they have no, in and of themselves, they have no inherent meaning. But Kant wants to rescue the mind, right, from Hume's denial of mind. So he posits a psychological theory about the structure of the intellect. That there are what he calls categories of understanding which filter the phenomenal realm and create meaning. This is akin to Locke's idea about our minds creating meaning. It's not hard to see how this is related to Locke's psychology and epistemology. It's just, it's more elaborate. It answers more of Hume's argument. Of course, tonight we don't have, we would need months to talk about David Hume and Locke and so forth in, in, in depth. I'm just summarizing these ideas. Okay. Now, unlike the Frenchman that we discussed above, Voltaire, Rousseau, Diderot, and so forth, Hume and Kant did not see themselves as revolutionaries. They, not, they didn't see themselves that way. The social, they didn't think they were creating social revolution. Hume wrote a history of England, for example, that's very popular among conservatives. Because Hume says, listen, all these ideologies, all this philosophy, forget all that stuff. Just be practical, get along, obey the king, you know, um, farm your land, go to parties, be a good chap. Classic British outlook, right? Just be a good chap. Just don't worry about all that ideology and those things you get all upset about. Just... You know, he's a good old practical fellow. He just wants to get along. He's also, he was quite a bon vivant. He was famous for riding around his carriage and going to as many parties as possible. Okay. Uh, Kant was a believing Lutheran. He went to church every Sunday. Okay. But the effect of their thought had destructive consequences. Okay. Because remember, ideas have consequences. Kant's solution to Hume's problem of knowledge is to say basically our minds make up what we think we know. Okay. And this becomes, every, every one of these errors is then accepted as truth by the subsequent philosopher who then builds on the, on the previous error or responds to the previous error or is in dialectic with the previous error. So it's just, it's a spiral downwards uh, into fragmentation and, and to, to, to skepticism. Uh, let me talk briefly about these secret societies. I don't want to go into detail about this. I'll just say a few things about it. Um, this is relevant to our own time. The past 20 years, especially since the 9-11 events right here in America, so-called conspiracy theories have gone from being considered as fringe right, to being accepted by a large number of people. Everybody's interested in it now. Everybody's calling someone else a conspiracy theorist. Everybody has their own conspiracy theory. right? Of course, most conspiracy theories about who controls our society and so forth are either totally false, like the really crazy ones about the aliens or reptilians or so forth, are they partial? Are they fragmentary? They can be deceptive. Often ascribing, usually ascribing all of our problems to one group, and that group's all powerful, right? They have control over everything, right? But the, the, the defects in a lot of conspiracy theories should not alter our accepting a reality. The reality is that history is not evolutionary. <clears throat> Things don't just happen, okay? One of the great triumphs of the real conspiracy against the church, the real conspiracy against Christianity, is that they've convinced everyone that stuff just happens. Just an evolutionary process. Tolstoy has the mo one of the most famous passages in, um, in, in literature about this, where he's, he's opening his section on the War of 1812 and making the argument that history would have produced Napoleon. If there had been a Napoleon, that would have, history would have produced a Napoleon. But it's just this impersonal, fateful process that it just... Things just happen. Mm -hmm. 
you see. So, so always we always have to remember that evolution is not real science. Evolution was a scam introduced to get people not so much to believe in dinosaurs or and so forth, but to get them to accept that everything is evolutionary. It's a philosophy of life. Stuff just happens. Okay. So you're not going to try to figure out who did it, who's responsible for it, because it you can't help it. It just happens. Right? The French Revolution was inevitable. The Russian Revolution was inevitable. Right? The progress from Christianity to reason was inevitable. Right? There's an evolutionary process. Nobody pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. You know, this is just stuff just happens. Right? This isn't true. <laughs> it's, it's, it's flatly false. Groups of people acting together, specific men who decide either to obey God or fight against God, right? They decide what's going to happen, and they make things happen. To a very great extent, the true history of the past 250 years is a hidden history of men who decide to fight against God. And who, they did it, and they're still doing it in very devious ways. Okay. While at least at first, if not now, publicly proclaiming their allegiance to the old Christian order, for a long time, they proclaim their allegiance to the old order, and they inhabit, they, they've come to inhabit all the positions of authority in the old order. And that's very clever, because the most traditional, most conservative, most noble, most patriotic segments of society re revere the old order, right? They revere the institutions. So what do you do? You inhabit, you hollow out, and you inhabit the institutions. You're wearing the face of the Pope, but you're really hate Catholicism, right? You're in the face of the minister, but you really hate the king. You see, you're in the face of the bishop, but you really hate your religion because you belong, you really, your real allegiance is to someone else or something else. Okay? It's undeniable, okay, based on any reasonable reading of publicly known data. When I, I'm not talking about Nostradamus <laughs> prophecies or, or secret um, documents that have to be uh, that you find it a lock and key. I'm just talking about things that everybody knows from public, publicly, well-known pub, publicly published documents, all right, that the influence of the Masonic lodges and other secret societies became very strong during this period, the 18th century, leading up to the French Revolution. Nobody seriously contests this, even people who, you know, are for the French Revolution. They say, yeah, it's a good thing. Why not? You see. In Father Seraphim's lecture on the French Revolution, which is lecture six, and by the way, I have sent out those notes electronically, but I can resend them out. All the all the audio, all the the transcriptions of all Father Seraphim's audio from the 1970s when he gave these lectures. Okay, he goes into detail, which we're not going to tonight. <laughs> he goes into detail about the organization activity of one group, the Illuminati, a kind of super masonry above masonry, started by someone called Jacob Weishaupt, or at least supposedly started by Jacob Weishaupt. Now we should study Father Seraphim's notes. So that Father Seraphim was a very serious person. He studied this very intensively. We should take Father Seraphim seriously. There's something going on here. Right? I'm not going to talk about it tonight, but we have Father Seraphim's notes so we can study them. But remember, due to the fact that these secret groups are secret, we can only form a partial picture. And we don't need to know everything about them. We don't want to know everything about them. Right? You can't get in. Once you get into this process of trying to figure out all these conspiracies, your mind can just go farther down and down and down. And it really is going down because... There is no bottom to it because the bottom is in hell somewhere. We only need to know enough to stay away from it and to recognize the false ideas and to recognize the behavior when we see it. Okay? We can never know when they're telling the truth about, their, about themselves because they're liars. So they partially reveal and partially conceal what they're about and they give you false leads. Right? So it's a hall of mirrors. It's very important not to put all your trust in one document. I'm not saying we shouldn't study these documents. I'm saying we can't put our trust in one set of documents or one theory about who these people are because of the nature of the thing. It's demonic. And demonic means it's pandemonium. It's, it's deceptive. And they're always lying. Okay? But we can study these things enough to know what we should do. It is not necessary to demonstrate that the, the, the actual Illuminati still exist as in a, in a lineal succession. A lot of theories have gone into that, right? Um, some theories are very obsessed with bloodlines of European families and so forth. Okay? But we don't need to get into all that. That doesn't matter. Right? We just need to realize several things. These are my... This is not, I'm not speaking dogmatically, of course. These are my, 
my suggestions as a Christian priest, as an Orthodox, who's observing this, there are several things I think we can say is, are, are pretty, pretty safe to say. That the anti-Christian character of our contemporary cons institutions, the government, religion, and so forth, have been created by design. Okay? This didn't just happen. It wasn't an evolutionary accident. It's by a conscious conspiracy of demons and evil men who worship demons. Right? It's, it's a recrudescence of paganism. Okay? We can also realize that they've spread many false ideas that we take for granted as being true. That's why we're doing this course, to uncover a lot of false ideas that are in the air that people take for granted. And we, were, we grew up in this modern society. We, we went through the same philosophical and scientific education that are, as everybody else. So these ideas were kind of just in the air. We, we have variously imbibed versions of these ideas as we're going along. Okay? So we have to uproot these ideas from ourselves. We're always going, uh, if we're, we really want to repent, really be orthodox, we'll, we'll constantly be uprooting false assumptions, false ideas from the world around us. Right? All this can be traced back to the rejection of orthodoxy. That's why we, we spent so much time on the first thousand years. We spent so much time in the 12th, 13th centuries. Just all this is a playing out right, of the rejection of orthodoxy. The apostasy of the formerly orthodox people. Now that happened in the West over many centuries, but now in modern times it's happening among historically orthodox people. We're just becoming like everybody else. Right? Four, we cannot put our trust in any of the historical institutions because they've been hollowed out from within. They're controlled by people whose goal is the opposite of that for which the institution was created. They are facades. Okay. So you say, how could the bishop do that? How could the patriarch say that? And you're going, you're going, it doesn't make sense. No, it only makes sense if the purpose is the opposite of what the church wants to accomplish. See, when you realize this and all, these all this behavior makes sense. It's like the educational system. People say, well, don't they realize this destroys the children? They're stupid. No, they're doing it to destroy the children. It's working. You see. So all of our trust has to be in God, not in men. Okay. And we have to seek out like-minded people. That's why we have these little classes, and that's why we, we, try to, we try to share truth with others, right, that we love, that we care about, people that we meet, people that we think are open. We seek out like-minded people and quietly do as much good as possible with them. So our creating an orthodox counter-revolution in the only, way the only way possible to do this, to be counter-revolutionary, one person at a time, one parish at a time, one community at a time, right? Personally, locally, personally. Okay. But we can only do this with a good effect if we are strict with ourselves. We have to have a pure confession of faith and a serious, active life of piety. We can't just live like everybody else and believe like everybody else and think we're going to save the world. Or we're going to, if, we, if I just watch the right talk show program and vote for this guy, we're going to save the world. Or, you know, or if I just join this secular organization that's going to save society... Uh, we have to be a pure confession of faith, and we have to have a serious life of piety. Um, so I, I got into this. I get into these these points about living how we're to live today, because the point of our course is, as we've said, orthodox survival. So going back to the 18th century, I brought it up today because of the 18th century, because the 18th century is the era in which the, these men who outwardly were preaching reason and enlightenment and order, and rationality, are secretly going to clubs where they're, they're performing pagan ceremonies, the most irrational things you can imagine. Okay. And, and, that, and, and they are creating a combination of a religion and a political conspiracy. Okay. That, that these things continued then over time. It began then, now it's, it's, it pivoted, with the French Revolution it pivots into the open revolutionary period, and we're still dealing with these, uh, this dynamic today.